Welcome back, nerds. Fino here with a guide for Miyamoto Iori. He's a four-star welfare servant introduced in the Samurai Remnant crossover event, but the realm of single-target sabers is a turbulent one, with contestants flying high or crashing hard, with not a lot of middle ground. Does our newest battle maniac have what it takes to make a name for himself? Let's find out. Leading off Yuri's skill set is Akin to Ice, a three-turn package of star absorption, crit damage, star income, and mental debuff resistance. By the time of Yuri's release, Mighty Chains will have been an established mechanic for quite a while, so you have the option of relying on its flat crit chance for your initial damage turn. This lets you hold Akin to Ice until you can actually draw Yuri's cards instead of trying to build stars in anticipation. For general usage though, consider this your lowest priority. Next up, we have Crimson Codex. It's a battery capping out at 30%. You also get 3 turns of attack, a 20 star dump, and 3 turns of a burn applied to all enemies. Every effect here scales with levels. This is Eerie's most important skill. With 20% from his starting charge of pen skill, you can immediately use his noble phantasm with a 50% craft essence like cranking. Eerie's event is available immediately after completing Fuyuki, so new players are going to find this type of combo very useful. More established masters will appreciate that this skill is also on a 6 turn cooldown, so between 2 coin lights and 2 turns passing naturally, it'll be up again on turn 3. Combine that with a swap Mystic Code and Oberon, and you can end things explosively. The burn seems like a weird addition, but it enables the use of Honey Lake, which grants Invuln Pierce in general and bonus damage specifically against burned enemies. If you want to go this route, consider the Consort of the Sun Command Code to re-up your burn during Crimson Codex's cooldown period. It'll give you crit damage as a bonus. Otherwise, run whatever crit codes you have, Mistress of the Heaven and the other usual suspects. The last of Yuri's standard skills is the Sword of Five Rings. It's a 3-turn rainbow buff with some small damage reduction and 2 hits of evasion. The rainbow buffs are a nod to his multitude of styles and also the gotcha 4-star servant from Samurai Remnant, Yui Shosetsu. She grants buffs based on whether you have Arts, Buster, Quick, or some combination of those buffs active. The evasion being hit-based is a nice touch, letting you fire and forget it on turn 1. In coin setups, it'll be back up by turn 3, but if you have any stacks remaining by the time this happens, you may be better off holding your second activation of 5 rings. This depends on whether you expect the fight to last much longer, in which case the evasion may take priority over the second round of rainbow buffs. Now let's take a look at Yuri's Noble Phantasm, Hidden Sword, Soaring Flash. There's no getting around it, but this is a bit of a spoiler for Samurai Remnant. The fact that he can dual wield Kojiro's signature move is something that he keeps up his sleeve until a decent way into the game. This is a single target buster attack with preemptive single turn sure hit and 3 turns of quick and buster performance. Its overcharge dumps out a small number of stars, 10 at 100%. The ramping effect of this noble phantasm can become very dangerous if you can manage Iori's charge. Running in with Koyanskaya is the obvious way to spam Soaring Flash, but by using Iori's lingering protection, you can also engineer a situation where he's the last one on the field. Then using Buster Quick Arts Chains or NP Quick Arts Chains gives you the chance to frequently build back up to Soaring Flash, letting you get some of that snowball effect without continuous help from charge supports. For this holdout scenario, you may want to consider getting Iori's Extra Attack of Pen skill as a second priority. Iori's role is a valid one, being a single target Buster Saber with face card potential. His competition within this class and card type consists of Rama, a woefully outdated beat stick, Brave Elizabeth, a very funny and bursty but otherwise clunky main attacker, Watanabe no Suna, who's kind of okay but limited by the narrow scope of his skill set, and finally there's Roland, who's the closest point of comparison. They have vaguely similar skill sets, with the main difference being that Roland has a bit more utility, a self cleanse and an AoE purge, while Eerie does more damage at equivalent NP levels. In fact, he does slightly more than Elizabeth, with her upgrade, but not including her third skill's RNG effects. Which is pretty impressive considering that these comparisons only count the first Noble Phantasm. In other words, before Iori snowballs. All this in a Welfare Servant. Between Iori and Hokusai, you should be able to settle most of your single target Saber needs. Iori handles the majority of encounters, while Hokusai can gain an edge in very long fights, where the durability of Castoria plus healer setups lets you win the Battle of Attrition. Also, break bar enemies that can bypass Iori's evasion. Miyamoto Iori is generally good and works with high and low end supports alike. Considering that he's free and has virtually no barrier to acquisition, you should grab him as soon as he becomes available. He represents a significant upgrade from most single target 4 star sabers. That and his animations are dope. Alright lads, story time. As far as I can tell there's not too much of note about the historical Miyamoto Iori. While I could talk about his role in Samurai Remnant, I think you guys might appreciate some background instead. The times Iori lived in. This is something Musashi repeatedly alludes to in Samurai Remnant, saying he was born in the wrong age. And she wasn't just saying this because of her… proclivities. So what made Musashi and Iori's lives so different? Well, Musashi was born early in the reign of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who had nominally united Japan after avenging Nobunaga's death. 
However, despite the Toyotomi's strides toward establishing order, there was still quite a bit of combat to be done. There were an immense number of fighting men from the armies of the Sengoku period, and in the waning days of this blood-soaked age, they could really go to town on each other. The various lords didn't really want these people going around and killing each other for sport, and my understanding is that laws against this sort of thing were already on the books. But who's gonna enforce them? The Toyotomi had an interest in preventing non-samurai from keeping weapons, but preventing the samurai themselves from killing each other doesn't seem to have been very high on the list of priorities. Musashi was going around dueling people while Hideyoshi was still alive, and things only became easier after the Battle of Sekigahara, when the Tokugawa gained dominance. They established the Tokugawa Shogunate in 1603, but they didn't really become undisputed masters of the country until they defeated the Toyotomi remnants 12 years later. That's when the Siege of Osaka concluded. This is the same siege in which Chacha met her end. While the Tokugawa were cementing their control, the historical Musashi managed to squeeze in a few more duels, going as late as 1621, only about two years before he adopted Iori. Musashi ended his career with like 60 duels under his belt, an absolutely crazy number. But by the time Iori became a man, the Tokugawa had established much of their vision for stability and they exerted a degree of control over much of society from top to bottom. Those laws on paper, like the one against dueling, they now had the resources to enforce them. Wandering swordsmen in search of fights started to look a lot like bandits and tended to attract the wrong kind of attention from the shogunate. It was still possible to find legitimate action as a bodyguard, but this was a much more stifling state of affairs than before. In consolidating power, the shogunate also caused tremendous upheavals within the samurai classes. There were a lot of land confiscations, and without land, many of these former lords couldn't pay their samurai entourages. Anyone who still had land was forced to contend with the system of being required to repeatedly travel back and forth to the capital. Because of this, the daimyo didn't have much cash to spare, so they set their samurai loose as ronin. The sheer number of ronin meant that there was a tremendous supply of fighting men at a time when the demand for them was at an all-time low. Because samurai had restrictions on what they could or couldn't do, they were extremely limited in their ability to pursue side hustles. So their options were... A. Swallow their pride, give up their swords, and find employment as commoners. Or B. Keep their swords and be miserable and poor. That might explain the tiny shack Iori has in Samurai Remnant, though the actual Iori seems to have worked under a lord, so I'm guessing he was better off. A number of these ronin turned to organize crime in the cities or banditry out in the countryside, but a lot of them were just there, stewing. This would cause the shogunate problems in very short order, but that's a story better left for when we get to Yui Shosetsu. While the relative stability of the Edo period was no doubt a boon for the average Joe, who no longer had to worry about being raided by hostile armies or conscripted into yet another war, it would have been a living hell for a battle maniac. Either they plunge into criminality and deal with having a target on their back, or they sit and allow their sword to rust in its scabbard. Barring the odd rebellion, the swords of Japan would be allowed to rust for over 200 years. Such is the price of peace and isolation. Let me know if you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more, and come watch me at twitch.tv slash where I stream every week. Got a big schedule this time around with bangers like Golden Sun, Blue Archive, Trouble in Terrorist Town, and an FGO support review. So follow me there if you want to get in on the action. Till next time.